Hello, and welcome again to Musing Heavy with Stephen Meyer, the site devoted to alternative reflections on hard rock and heavy metal. Uh, this YouTube presentation is essentially part two, um, and it's based on my essay entitled The Importance of Labeling, The Case of Lulu, and Lulu being the collaboration between Lou Reed and Metallica on their 2011 album entitled Lulu, and here it is. And in that, that part, uh, part one of the YouTube presentation, I make the argument that one of the key reasons why Lulu was so poorly received, both commercially and critically, had to do with inappropriate labeling, at least in my humble opinion. Um, it was a situation where because Lulu was given equal billing between Lou Reed and Metallica, which in fact I argue it shouldn't have been because it's, it most honestly is a Lou Reed album. There is no other album in the Metallica catalog that resembles anything on Lulu, but in fact, it is very much a Lou Reed album given he, he, that he wrote the vast majority of it and it was based on his vision, right? So the problem that Lulu has is that the metal community didn't understand Lulu at all. And I think it's because of labeling that they perceived it as another Metallica album, right? Which it wasn't. And, and I think the art rock community maybe which is most associated with Lou Reed, also didn't give Lulu a fair shot because of its connotations with Metallica, right? I mean, sad but true, so to speak. I think that uh, heavy metal is still looked down upon by many people, especially, say, folks in the art rock community. And I think the fact that Lou Reed was collaborating with a metal band, I think also hurt uh, uh, the chances really hurt the chances of Lulu becoming successful in a lot of ways, right? So I make the argument in the essay, and by the way, I encourage everybody to read the essay if you're into this stuff, if you wanna see my arguments in a little more coherent fashion, the link is provided below. But um, in that YouTube video, I make the argument that it would have perhaps been more appropriate to call Lulu, right, uh, rather than Lou Reed and Metallica, but call it Lou Reed with Metallica, which takes some of the weight off this equal billing, which would imply Metallica being the backing band for Lou Reed on this project, which essentially they were very important, but a backing band nevertheless, or preferably don't even put Metallica's name on it at all, right? Just call it Lou Reed. And yes, give the Metallica guys credit, you know, within the album jacket, but don't list Metallica at all. That would have calmed down, I think, a lot of the anxiety in the metal community who misinterpreted this as somehow a new direction of Metallica. I think that that would have taken Metallica's name off it. People would have interpreted it as, okay, it's Metallica just helping Lou Reed, you know, reach his musical vision, which I think was always the idea. And it would have certainly taken some of the anxiety away from the art rock community who wouldn't have viewed this as somehow Lou Reed's turning heavy metal or something like that, right? So... Um, so what I'm going to do in part two in this particular YouTube video is sort of look at, okay, how could this have been approached to make Lulu more successful in terms of both commercial and also critical acclaim? And so we'll sort of continue on in my essay. As I say, follow the links if you want to read it in, in more precise detail. But I think there was a precedent set for Lulu, right? Perhaps the closest comparison one can make of the Lulu situation is really with Neil Young's Mirror Ball album, right? And he, in which he uses Pearl Jam uh, on this 1995 album, which I think is excellent as well. I absolutely love Lulu, and I think Mirror Ball is excellent as well. The, 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 the comparisons between Lulu and Mirror Ball are actually very striking, and, and it makes for you know, an interesting discussion, I believe. So like Lulu... Mirror Ball features some co-writing credits, right? But it's primarily the work of one artist who happens to be backed by a very famous band, right? This is unequivocally a Neil Young album, okay? But Pearl Jam backs them up. Pearl Jam plays, plays on the album. Now, of course, I'm sure everybody or pretty much everybody's heard of Pearl Jam, of course, and some of you might be Pearl Jam fans. They're not heavy metal, but they certainly can, they can rock hard at times. 
But of course, Pearl Jam is most known, I suppose, as being a, one of the big four or five of the Seattle grunge scene that they sort of came out of that environment. So Pearl Jam, allow, along with, say, you know, Soundgarden, Nirvana, Alice in Chains, those are probably your big four, or you might add a couple more to that, perhaps, right? But Pearl Jam sort of, in a lot of ways, maybe one of the kingpins of that movement, which again, is very striking to their, their, their similarities with Metallica sort of in a different world, where Metallica was always, has always been promoted as one of the big four of thrash metal, right? So you got Metallica, along with Anthrax, along with Slayer, along with uh, Megadeth, I'd probably add Exodus and Testament, maybe a couple others, but there's no question Metallica, again, pretty much the kingpins, you could argue, uh, of the thrash metal movement, right? And so to me, the situations were really quite similar. You've got a visionary artist in Lou Reed that's being backed by one of the top four or five of a particular genre, not unlike Neil Young being backed by one of the top four or five of another musical genre. Right. But the way the labeling was approached was completely different. And I think that's why Mere Ball didn't have near the backlash as Lulu did. All right. So uh, Mere Ball is credited solely to Neil Young. You're not going to see Pearl Jam on here anywhere. Right. It's not in the it, 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 it's it, it's not in the packaging. It's not in the labeling at all. Right. Unlike Lulu, where it's Lou Reed and Metallica. Right. So. The fact that Mere Ball is, is credited solely to Neil Young, there was no mistaking the intent of, of what this was about. There was no confusion surrounding the release of, of Mere Ball, and as a result, no significant backlash. Like Reed, Young has a rich history of using a number of backing bands, but the product always manages to sound much like Neil Young, right? Therefore, for fans of Neil Young, this was just more of the same. Neil was not selling out to contemporary grunge, although kind of ironically, he, he was sort of, and some might argue that Neil Young was a huge influence on the grunge movement later on, but nevertheless, it wasn't viewed that way at all. And Pearl Jam fans correctly saw this as an isolated musical project, not indicative of where the band might be headed. So again, as I talk about in the first video and, and in this essay as well, the backlash from the Metallica crowd over Lulu was absolutely immense. Right. Well, we didn't have any backlash from the Pearl Jam uh, uh, crowd here because, again, it wasn't a Pearl Jam album or it wasn't perceived as such. But here's the thing. Would Mirror Ball have been so free of external ba baggage had it been labeled as Neil Young and Pearl Jam, i.e. like Lulu, where it's Lou Reed and Metallica? I think the answer is no. I think if Mere Ball would have been Neil Young and Pearl Jam, there would have been lots of baggage associated with it. There's every possibility that Neil Young would have been accused of cashing in on the, on the grunge craze, which was kind of at, at pretty much near its peak at that point. And also, no doubt, Pearl Jam fans would have loudly lamented the lack of Eddie better vocals on the album. If again, if you put Pearl Jam on there, it's like, oh, where's Eddie? Well, Eddie doesn't play a big role on Mirror Ball, a little background, but that's about it. Um, but you might say, well, yeah, but Neil Young does give his backing bands equal billing lots of times. And he does. I mean, there's lots of albums in Neil Young's catalog that are Neil Young, but there's lots of them where he's sharing the billing. Neil Young and Crazy Horse, Neil Young and the Blue Notes, Neil Young and the Stray Gators, Neil Young and the Shocking Pinks, and on it goes, right? But really, it's the magnitude that matters here, okay? That's what's making all the difference. Neil Young's cachet is weighty enough to not cause serious debate when he's sharing the label, say, with Crazy Horse, right? Doesn't matter if it's with Crazy Horse, the Stray Gators, whatever, everyone's still going to view this very much as a Neil Young album. OK, so you, 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 you're not really going to have that sort of baggage. It's really the same. I mean, another good example might be Stevie Ray Vaughan, you know, the, the, the famous blues rock guitarist. Stevie Ray Vaughan typically shared the billing with with Double Trouble, but that wouldn't have mattered whether an album was called Stevie Ray Vaughan or Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble. Everybody still would have viewed this as a Stevie Ray Vaughan album. Right. OK, however. You're not going to get that sort of neutrality with Pearl Jam. Pearl Jam is way too big. The Pearl Jam brand is too massive to expect this to have, to have no impact, right? So it was important to not emphasize this musical liaison 
in the labeling so as to not misrepresent the product and distort expectations. Because this clearly was a Neil Young album, right? He wrote the majority of it and it was his vision. It, was, it, would, it made a lot of sense that you're not putting Pearl Jam on the label, right? That made sense, right? And again, it was honest and, and it didn't misrepresent what the product was about. The labeling was consistent with what was actually, you know, in the music, right? Lulu wasn't, right? The Metallica label carries Pearl Jam-like weight. So anytime you attach Metallica to something, you know, it, it's going to have an impact. You know, it's not like Crazy Horse or the Shocking Pinks. When you put Metallica on there, it's going to, it's going to, people are going to have a strong opinion about it, right? The Metallica label carries Pearl Jam like bulk, which presumably inadvertently condemned Lulu to misconception and semi obscurity, right? I say presumably because who knows what the motivations were. Maybe, maybe they were, maybe they totally understood what they were doing with the labeling and they wanted it to be misrepresented. I mean, I, I don't know if that's, True, but in Lou Reed's case, hard to tell. If you don't believe me, check out uh, Metal Machine music. Um, so it's never that clear what Lou Reed's uh, motivations are. Some would say that's maybe the most extreme thing ever recorded. Um, some called it career suicide, et cetera, et cetera. But the bottom line is, if the intention with Lulu was to be, if they wanted it to be critically acclaimed and they wanted it to be reasonably successful, then I think it's the labeling that let them down, right? Whereas if you look to what Neil Young did, the labeling was much more consistent with what the music was about. Okay. Or <laughs> perhaps you might see this a lot, you know, that maybe I'm overthinking this, right? You might think, well, here's the thing, Steve. Mirrorball is great. Lulu is not. And that's really the bottom line here. That's why it wasn't well received because Lulu's no good and Mirrorball was great. Okay. I don't happen to think that, but hey, that could be it too. I could just be overthinking this, but anyway. Um, in my opinion, I think the labeling had a lot to do with that. Okay. There's another way, Lou, there's another route that they could have taken with Lulu too. Um, remember I, I mentioned earlier, and again, I talked about this in the first, in, in the first uh, part of the presentation, um, that I, you know, I, I think the problem was that it was called Metallica or sorry, Lou Reed and Metallica. It should have just been called Lou Reed. Another alternative would have been not to call it Lou Reed or Metallica, right? Um, you could have actually um, branded this Lulu, right? Not Metallica, not Lou Reed, or perhaps another name. I don't know if Lulu is such a good name for a band, right? But make it a new band, okay? If you wanted to market this um, to the more mainstream, well, then labeling it as a super group, you know, if that's, or marketing it as such, probably would have been a good strategy because the mainstream seems to like the idea of super groups, right? You know, that, that the sum of the parts, you know, or, or the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts kind of thing, or at least it's different, right? Now, could, could you have gotten away with Lulu being or, so, or calling it something like that, a super group? Ah, maybe yes, maybe no. You might have had to add another high profile member in addition to Lou Reed and Metallica to truly make it a super group. Or really, you probably could have just elevated the status of some of the other musicians that actually played on Lulu because there's a lot of other guest musicians on there. So you probably could have done that, right? But if you didn't want to market this to the mainstream and you, and you, you realize, okay, really our true audience is probably more on the fringe, more on the periphery, right? Which admittedly probably Lulu is, right? Well, then I think, you know, uh, you probably could have marketed this to perhaps the doom metal, subgenre or perhaps to the gothic environment too i think that i think lulu would have been a much better fit for people listening to doom metal or for people listening to gothic music right it's a far better fit than people listening to sort of what's typical metallica right for instance which it's not really a fit at all right i mean i think it's a pretty good fit with doom metal and if it would have been labeled and marketed as such i mean many of the guitar riffs on lulu would not sound out of place on a Candlemass album. Love Candlemass. They're awesome. Candlemass album or a Trouble album or Celtic Frost or maybe even the Melvins. I mean, the Melvins are kind of more an alternative band, I guess, but they certainly get really heavy at times, right? And, and, and the subject matter, uh, I mean, def of Lulu, definitely coincides with maybe stuff that My Dying Bride would do or Anathema, Paradise Lost, Opet, a typo negative. I mean, come on. 
uh, I, I, I'm, I'm almost convinced that the late great Pete Steele would have loved Lulu, right? And, and I'm sure if it was marketed towards Type O fans, I think a lot of Type O fans would like Lulu, Lulu right? I also think God, people who, are, who are, are fans of, of gothic music would like this too, um, especially the soul-crushing sort of atmosphere of Lulu. I think it fits in really well with a lot of goth music, right? So fans of, say, Sisters of Mercy or Christian Death or, say, Joy Division, The Birthday Party, The Swans, maybe even Marilyn Manson fans, right? If it would have been marketed towards them, I think probably would have been very receptive towards Lulu if they, if they haven't caught on to it yet, right? And again, I think it would have really worked. It, you would have to have taken, I think, the Metallica name off it. So either it's just Lou Reed or it's this new band called Lulu or something. Because, I mean, admittedly, um, you know, a lot of people who listen to gothic music are some, again, sometimes have a poor perception of heavy metal by taking the Metallica name off it, I think may have, may have enticed them to maybe check this out, which again, I, is a little ironic. I, there's a lot of music, there's certain types of heavy metal and, and gothic music that aren't that different, but the two don't often play well together as it turns out. Right. So again, I think there's ways that Lulu's impact could have been very immediate rather than having maybe to wait 20, 30 years for people to get it if it would have been labeled more appropriately, either just as a Lou Reed album or as a new band called Lulu, and then, and then promoted towards appropriate some genres of music. And, and, the, and like I say, the examples that come to my head are, would be like doom metal, which again, Metallica really has nothing to do with, at least the typical of Metallica music, or indeed uh, gothic music, right? Okay, so let's just sort of generalize this a little bit. The necessary evils of labeling. So again, I, I know um, that, uh, that, that, that music purists and a lot of artists themselves really hate the idea of labeling. They don't like being categorized. They don't like the idea of having to be pigeonholed, et cetera. But I think this type of musical uh, categorization matters, uh, even though it's often an annoyance. It gives music enthusiasts, myself, and I'm sure many people listening, reviewers, and indeed the bean counters, the people who are just in this for the money, important points of reference to more accurately do what is necessary with the product, right? So although we might not like the idea of categorizing and stereotyping and labeling, I think it really is necessary. It's, it's, it's a necessary evil. In the absence of appropriate labeling, everything seems to function less effectively. And again, I, 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 that's the argument I've been making with Lulu. I think that's, that's the big demon here. For example, many of us record uh, music lovers, we still, a lot of us still put a lot of emphasis on record reviews, right? And they come in many forms today. Um, I mean, yes, today we have the ability to check out new music, music before we buy it or before we download it, right? But a lot of us still put a lot of emphasis on what other people think when it comes to, I mean, there's just so much stuff out there, right? So a lot of us put a lot of faith in album reviews. Um, you know, some of this still comes from professional writers, right? So there's still established periodicals such as Mojo, Pitchfork, Rolling Stone, Spin, right? There's all kinds of websites out there that study specific genres of music that provide really great reviews of particular albums and et cetera. Um, and then there's more informal uh, sources we can always go to, sort of all kinds of online chatterers. Um, who sometimes write really great reviews for like Amazon, right? When you're looking to purchase, all, all, you know, whether it be downloads or CDs or whatever, you see all kinds of people writing their reviews. Some of them are really, really good. Or the All Music Guide is kind of that way too. Another source that I really enjoy checking out, right? But here's my point about proper labeling and where this, this, can, this can affect reviews. It can be very frustrating to read an assessment of an album from a writer that clearly has no familiarity of maybe important nuances of the music at hand, right? I mean, when writers are writing their reviews, I mean, everybody has an opinion and that's totally fine, but lots of opinions maybe don't really get the music. And that, that to me can be frustrating. I know as a young metal head or younger metal head, um, you know, before there was the internet and all that sort of stuff, I used to get really frustrated with, um, with, uh, with record reviews. Not, not so much, you know, if I loved an album, the reviewer hated it. That's fine. Opinion, it's all good. I mean, opinion is fine. But when you read the review and it was very clear that reviewer had no idea 
about the band or or the music, et cetera. Like they, they were totally out of their league kind of thing, right? I mean, it may have been the greatest metal album ever written and they're still going to hate it because they don't really get that. It would be like me trying to review, you know, a freeform jazz album. I mean, I'm not going to get it. It might be the greatest album ever written, but I'm, I'm not going to get it because it's not, it's not in my wheelhouse, so to speak, right? Um, so, you know, what, what can happen, like I say, it can be really frustrating when a reviewer, you know, writes something and it's clearly they don't get it, right? So that, that, can, be, that can be frustrating. And I think that can happen for a number of reasons, but I think a lot of this has to do with la the labeling of the product at the root. Right. Consider the professional writer who posts an opaque or uninformative review because he or she well, was given a new album to assess that was outside of their expertise. Right. And I'm, I'm sure that happens. And, and, and I think the essence of that is because if bands aren't properly labeled, if you don't know what to do with it, we've got band X and we don't know what genre they belong to. OK, you you review this. Right. And if that reviewer has no sympathy for that type of music, well, then the review gets put out and it's not useful or it's misleading or whatever, right? And I think, again, the root of that could be inaccurate labeling of the music. Again, whether we like that or not, I think that, that, can, that can affect things. You know? Or another scenario might involve a potentially revolutionary band, a band that you know, really, you know, music-wise, could, could be changing everything for us, right? But they continue to wallow in obscurity because they defy easy classification, you know, and then because of that, then their art never gets pushed uh, by the proper promoters or et cetera. It doesn't get viewed properly. Right. Because, again, we there's no way to classify it. So it just sort of slips through the cracks all the time. Right. And, and bringing this into sort of a modern, a very modern context, I mean, you know, with all the search engine algorithms that we all kind of live with these days that are all that are driven by keywords by and large, right? Um, it, 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 it's, this is going to be, this approach today is very unhelpful to bands that are hard to classify, that don't have accurate classification tags, right? So there's so many bands out there with so many albums. I mean, I guess it's good and bad news. The good news is it's actually relatively easy for somebody to produce their own music and put it online. The bad news is it's relatively easy for people to produce their own music and put it on. I mean, in other words, everybody's doing it, right? So there's just so much out there. And if you're, if you're an artist that's not easy to classify, if it's, it's, it's easy to mislabel what you're doing, then your target audience might never hear what you've got to say. And, and you might have something really important to say, right? So you become sort of a needle forever lost in the cyberspace haystack, so to speak, if we can't find a way to properly label what you're doing, right? Or in a much more informal way. How can I recommend the recent work of a new band, say to a friend or some, or, or, you know, or, or just an acquaintance or whatever, if I don't have the, the, the words to describe what they're like? You know, um, I'm, I, I'm hearing this new band and I go, you know what? They're kind of a throwback. They're kind of proto metal. They might remind you a bit of Deep Purple. They're sort of heavy at times like Black Sabbath, right? Again, I, I, I sort of have the words to describe what they are. I'm labeling them. And again, the artist might hate that, but I'm labeling them to give my friend a point of reference. Ah, okay, proto metal. So before there was heavy metal, a little bit like, okay, I know Deep Purple. I know the Black Sabbath. Okay, I sort of get what you're saying. Right. Or another band say, OK, yeah, they're sort of they're more traditional thrash metal, but they got a little new metal work, you know, you know, interwoven in what they're doing. Again, you're giving people points of reference when we can label bands. Um, and, and yes, we are categorizing them. But I, again, I think we're giving bands a better shot to be heard and then ultimately maybe for their music to be bought if we can do that. Right. So can we expect an artist's work to be fully appreciated if the right audience never gets to hear it? Um, or if reviewers miss the point of the art and the wrong audience then only shouts it down? I think that's largely what happened to Lulu. So much of the right audience for Lulu never really got a chance to hear it or it wasn't labeled appropriately that they're going to bother to really check it out, right? So I think it is consequential how we identify an artist's work so it can be fairly appraised by the appropriate spectators. Um, and like I say, labeling to me is, is really important, even if we kind of hate it from a music perspective, right? So yeah, it would be nice to think that labeling is, is just an add-on. It's just not that important because true music people are really open-minded and willing to give everything a fair chance. Well, really, that doesn't really work, does it? It'd be nice if it did, but it really, most people, that doesn't work. 
In fact, we know that an appreciation for music driven only by its own merits in the absence of familiar markers, i.e. appropriate labeling, seems to only work for a few of us, right? And really good evidence of that is demonstrated when band labels outlast the loss of significant and or original members, right? I mean, an example might be, um, is the 2021 version, today's version of Deep Purple aptly branded, right? Are they labeled appropriately? Because there are those, perhaps many, who believe that it has been decades since the Deep Purple label on the album jacket accurately represents the music within, right? Yet the Deep Purple monitor, moniker sorry, persists nevertheless, right? So again, I talk about that in some detail. Uh, you might uh, definitely, if, you, if you're into this, check out my essay entitled When to Retain the Group Name, uh, Defining and Applying the Led Zeppelin and, and Deep Purple Paradigms. Um, basically, what I argue, it's sort of related to some of the things I'm talking about here, too, with labeling. But here it's more specific to group labeling. And this one has to do with um, what happens when original members leave a band or key members leave a band? Should, the, should that particular group carry on with the name? When is it appropriate to, to carry on and when is it not appropriate? There are those who think, for instance, that you, know, you should only call this band Black Sabbath if Ozzy Osbourne is singing for it, right? And then there's others who will say, well, that's nonsense. You know, as long as Tony Iommi's in the band, it's, it's totally fair to call it Black Sabbath. So what I develop in that particular essay, and it will be, a, it is also a two-part uh, YouTube presentation, is I sort of provide, again, in my humble little way, I provide sort of a format that we perhaps could follow as to when it's appropriate when a band should maybe carry on with the name, even if some key members or original members leave, and when it would be better if the band would have called themselves something else. Right. So I think, I, again, I come up with sort of a little framework that you, that you may find interesting. OK, so anyway, thanks for listening. And hopefully you'll check out some of my other videos and essays as well. Have a great day.